Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Nargis Bajopli, and I'm an assistant professor at uh, SAIS Johns Hopkins. Uh, today's fireside chat is a part of SAIS's Rethinking Iran initiative, which we started in the spring of 2019. We have a very exciting lineup of speakers for this term. We've already hosted a distinguished uh, number of speakers, including Ambassador Bill Burns, Ariane Tabotabai, Ilan Goldenberg. And we have two book talks forthcoming in the coming weeks with Bill Gordon and Arzu Osanlu. You can find out more about our events and our programming uh, at Rethinking Iran um, on our website, rethinkingiran.com. As part of our larger SAIS initiative for research on contemporary Iran, which this event series is a part of, we've just launched today the first comprehensive research project that looks at the effects of US sanctions on Iran. The project is entitled Iran Under Sanctions. It's run out of our initiative as well as SISIS Foreign Policy Institute and it's led by Ali Baez, a FPI fellow. It will include over a dozen reports, all drawn from original research, and will include uh, on, on such topics as the political economy, sociocultural issues, the environment, and furthermore. Today, we released two of our first reports on the effects of sanctions on the Iranian economy, as well as on the energy sector. And you can find those on our website, rethinkingiran.com, or on any of our social media accounts uh, at SICE Iran. We're streaming today's event on our YouTube channel. Um, and so we thank those of you who are uh, joining us from YouTube as well as Zoom and all of the other platforms that we're streaming on. We'll be monitoring all of these platforms for Q&A. Um, so please do put your questions into the chat boxes on whatever platform you are looking at. We will be gathering those and then posing them uh, to our speaker uh, later on this hour. As our third semester for this series is ongoing, and though it's in the COVID world, we're very excited to invite scholars and analysts to help us better understand this critical juncture in US-Iran relations, which is a part of the main focus for our fall programming. With the idea that the conversations in DC and within the US on Iran and US-Iran relations tend to be quite limited to say the least, our goal in this initiative is to help broaden this conversation by inviting those uh, who can help us push beyond the rigid frameworks of the past 40 years. Today's conversation will cover US-Iran relations in the aftermath of the Trump presidency. We're very honored to have Ambassador Wendy Sherman with us today for this critical conversation, and she'll be joined by my colleague, Professor Vadi Nast. As a quick way of introduction, Ambassador Wendy Sherman is a professor of the practice of public leadership and director of the Center for Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School. Ambassador Sherman led the US negotiating team that reached the agreement on the JCPOA between the P5 plus one, the European Union and Iran, for which among other diplomatic accomplishments, she was awarded the National Security Medal by President Barack Obama. Vadi Nas is a professor of Middle East Studies and International Affairs at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and spearheads the Rethinking Iran series at SAIS. He is the author of many books, including The Dispensable Nation, American Foreign Policy and Retreat, Forces of Fortune, The Rise of the New Muslim Middle Class, and What It Will Mean for Our World, and the Shia Revival. Without further ado, I'll turn over the conversation to uh, Ambassador Sherman and Professor Nas. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bajogli. Uh, it's a uh, truly great uh, privilege to welcome back uh, Ambassador Sherman to, to SAIS. Uh, she's a friend of the school and we're privileged to hear from her. Uh, she's uh, a seasoned and senior diplomat who has been engaged in nuclear negotiations, not only with Iran, but also with North Korea and, and, and he, during her tenure as Deputy Secretary of State and Under Secretary of State oversaw uh, the discussions with Iran. And, uh, and as we know that uh, uh, as a new administration is coming in, Iran and the fate of the nuclear program that is one of the top uh, policy issues that is being debated and discussed. So thank you for this very timely conversation. I, I wanted to start by sort of asking very broadly, where do you think things stand? Uh, we know that President-elect uh, Biden wrote a piece in CNN. He, he described the manner in which the United States uh, may rejoin the deal. But there's a lot of uh, debate about the health of the deal, how far Iran has moved away from it, and, uh, and, and what is possible. So I just wanted to get, gauge what your thinking is about uh, where we stand right now. 
Uh, thank you, um, Valley, and it's terrific to be uh, here with you at SAIS uh, and with Nargis in this really important program to think broadly about Iran and where we might be headed. So thank you for having me join. Uh, I'm only speaking for myself today, and I want to make that clear. I obviously am a su strong supporter of the president-elect and the vice president-elect, but I'm, I'm not speaking for them. I'm speaking for myself. Um, I think we're at a very difficult place. Uh, there is no doubt that the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action is barely hanging on by a thread at this point. Um, I do think we should take hope in the fact that uh, even after President Trump uh, withdrew from the JCPOA uh, in 2018, uh, he, um, uh, the deal continued uh, for quite some time and certainly continued uh, for virtually all the years of the Trump administration uh, because Iran sought to maintain compliance because the Europeans, Russia and China tried to maintain compliance uh, to hang on to the JCPOA in part waiting for our presidential election. That said, because of a whole series of actions uh, by both the United States and Iran, we are now at a place where Iran is, has taken steps that go beyond the compliance of the JCPOA. Uh, the most recent uh, report about using more advanced centrifuges uh, is of concern, of course. Uh, so we're at a really tough, tough place uh, where uh, it appears that President Trump is trying to uh, create uh, as many uh, chips on the side of the United States and Iran is trying to create as many chips on the side of Iran uh, before the new administration. Um, and I think that uh, President Trump, uh, we've seen from reports, also consider taking military action, which uh, hopefully his advisors and uh, members of the uh, Defense Department and of our armed services will continue to urge him not to do uh, because it could quickly turn into an uh, a, a much wider war than taking out a nuclear facility. So we're, we're at a really tough place. So um, uh, let's say if, if nothing worse happens between now and, 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 and the 20th, uh, I mean, what are the modalities that you would think are, are possible for, for the two sides to re-engage within, within JCPOA? Uh, I mean, what is it that the United States would need from Iran and what is possible for any, any American administration to, to give in order to, um, to, to sort of resuscitate the deal? I don't think we can know all those answers, Valley, until uh, we do some work uh, and uh, regain some fingertips about what's going on. Um, I certainly think that will include uh, consultations with uh, uh, the UK, France, and Germany, as well as the European Union writ large. Uh, it will even include some consultations with Russia and China, with whom we will have very complicated relations in the next administration. Um, and it will take some homework on our part to see uh, where we are, uh, what sanctions have been added, um, where our partners in the JCPOA are, where Iran is, uh, Iran will be doing its own thinking. They are approaching a presidential election in 2021, uh, which uh, you probably know better than I, will be uh, quite a conservative election uh, because the parliamentary election this last year uh, put what I call more hard hardliners in place instead of hardliners. And I suspect that's the way the presidential election will go as well. Rouhani cannot run again. Uh, so uh, Iran has had to deal with COVID just like every other country has and uh, has had a very rough time. Then again, the United States has had a very rough time. Uh, but um, uh, Iran is continuing uh, to build its relations uh, with countries to try to position itself in the best place possible uh, for the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, but I don't think it's gonna be on day one, everything will fall back into place. Uh, that's not going to happen. I can't hear you, you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, that's the bane of, of the Zoom. Uh, uh, I wanted to pick on a strand uh, that, that uh, of, of what you just said, namely about um, 
about uh, uh, what the elections in Iran could produce. And, uh, and, and given, you know, you, you sat across the table with many, many negotiators, and of course you, you dealt with, with Iran over two years. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, does it matter who on the other, who, who's on the other side of the table? In other words, uh, if it's not uh, Zarif or Rouhani's team, and if it's a more hardline or, or, or very conservative side, uh, does it make a difference to the dynamics of, uh, of the talks? Well, politics always uh, change the dynamics of the talks. Uh, and I, I think it will depend upon not only who is elected in Iran, and I think everyone listening understands that whatever slate of people run have been approved uh, by higher ups in uh, the Iranian regime. So this is not a full and free uh, democratic election uh, in, in the sense that we know it and, and hopefully are continuing it here in our own country. Uh, but uh, if it is a very, very hard line administration, uh, it will depend on whether they see uh, a positive in re-engaging with the United States, if they feel they need to um, provide economic relief for the Iranian people, uh, you know, as I've said many, many times, um, sanctions generally do not change bad behavior. Sanctions compel countries or uh, adversaries or people on the other side of the table to decide whether they want to come to the negotiations and what they want to try to achieve in those negotiations. So it is conceivable that a very hard line, hard, hard line uh, administration in Iran uh, will decide that they need to do something about the Iranian economy and the sanctions on Iran. Uh, but it is possible they will decide to take a different tact. Um, so that is what we will have to deal with. So I think uh, I would hope that a Biden-Harris administration uh, will get underway in those consultations very early on to see what's possible because uh, the window for gaining any traction is quite short uh, given the presidential election in Iran and may have to wait to see how that plays out. So the dynamics are very complicated uh, for everyone. So given that uh, there, there would be between January and, and June uh, for, for an election and then June till uh, end of August when actually the, a new administration will formally take over in Iran. I mean, there's, there's been some debate about whether it's beneficial for the United States to aggressively try to start the process with the existing Iranian administration given the fact that you know, they, they have a vested interest in JCPOA and have already uh, negotiated once with the United States, uh, or to actually wait until um, uh, there is a there is a new um, uh, a new order in Iran. Uh, does it? Wh what are your thoughts? What, what, does it make a difference, or or do you think it's better to for the U.S. to start faster? I think it's important for the U.S. to start its consultations as quickly as a new administration can. There's a lot a new administration is going to have to do. Uh, as uh, the president-elect said in his remarks uh, when he accepted the re results of the election that made him the next president of the United States, he said, this is no, not about the example of our power, it's about the power of our example. And went on to say that meant us taking on and putting in place uh, what we need to control the coronavirus until everyone can be vaccinated, which is going to take some time. Uh, he said it was meaning putting, restoring our economy, uh, building our infrastructure, innovation, our ability to compete. Uh, it meant uh, dealing with our social justice issues, uh, since we have seen the disparities in our country uh, and the racial justice in our country uh, in, in terrible shape and needing to be um, ameliorated in every way possible. Uh, so the United States is going to have to focus internally uh, in a very profound way, as will every country in the world, because every country in the world is confronting their own COVID crisis, their own economic crisis, uh, their own disparities 
uh, in the treatment and the dealing with their economy and with COVID. Uh, all of that said, um, the administration, I expect, will have an extraordinarily experienced um, team, uh, a very wide and deep talent bench, but they're going to have to replace a lot of people because the State Department has been hollowed out. The Defense Department has to be rebuilt as well. The intelligence agencies, USAID, uh, our embassies around the world. Uh, but I hope we will begin the consultations. Uh, one can't do an effective negotiation just by getting in the room. Uh, in many ways, that's the least of it. It is the context. It is the team. It is understanding what you're trying to achieve. It's understanding what your partner's interests are, uh, who's going to be on the other side of the table, what their interests are, and whether, in fact, the timing works uh, to get uh, such a dialogue underway. Uh, so I don't think we know the full answer to your question, Valley, until we do all of the necessary homework. Uh, uh, personally, I would hope we'd be able to begin. Uh, if for no other reason, then um, I think the, the risks are always there uh, for inadvertence or accident to escalate uh, a situation uh, to a place that's not very good at all. Uh, and I also think that the Iranian people are suffering uh, daily uh, by the actions of the regime uh, that have brought about the sanctions uh, that uh, the Trump administration increased uh, in, in profound ways. Uh, there's no question that uh, the Trump administration sanctions work, uh, but to what end is not apparent to me at all. I've never understood, understood the tactic. I never have understood the strategy uh, because Iran has a larger stockpile of enriched material using more advanced centrifuges, we now believe, um, uh, doing things that perhaps are reversible, but uh, certainly are not helpful. Uh, breakout time is reduced. Uh, malign behavior in the Middle East has not stopped. Uh, human rights abuses have not stopped. Uh, Americans and others detained in Evan prison have not stopped. Uh, so I've never understood the strategy of the Trump administration, if they indeed have one. Let me ask you now uh, sort of about some of the your reaction and, and, and how do you think uh, the United States can 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 think its way through this that that you know Iran has over the past few months put certain conditionalities on the table. The, the most uh, controversial of these is the idea of a compensation uh, for the United States leaving the deal and then uh, imposing the, the sanctions that you mentioned which um, on the deal on, on Iran as a consequence. Now, uh, sort of in practical terms, uh, uh, you know, how 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 could the, we, the United States engage with Iran and sort of deal with this demand or go around it or or try to address it uh, without without it being exactly what it sounds like, like you're going to put pellets of, uh, of of cash on a plane, but 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 you know, how would you sort of uh, deal with this diplomatically? I think I think whenever people anticipate the possibility of negotiation, they often try to put as many chips on the table as possible. Uh, so that if indeed you do get to a negotiation, uh, it's more complex, uh, it's more demanding, it's more difficult. Uh, there's no way uh, to know today what is possible uh, without being in the middle of it. Uh, and so uh, I'm not surprised uh, that Iran, both because of the possible and pending negotiation and also because of their own internal politics, which have gotten more conservative, that they have put, started to put conditions on any um, uh, return to the JCPOA. Uh, they perceive that the Trump administration has added conditions uh, with all of their sanctions, uh, which have to get removed uh, by the next administration um, in, their, in their view. So um, President-elect Biden has said clearly that if Iran is 
ready to come back into compliance. The United States is ready to re-enter as well. Uh, so that everyone is back into compliance. Uh, so, um, but getting from here to there is uh, complicated. Right. But but you would you would think it's possible to sort of address this in in creative ways that uh, sort of gives Iranians something to show the domestic domestic constituency without putting the administration in a pickle here. Well, what I would say, Valley, is. Um, when we did the original negotiation, I would suspect that the vast majority of people thought it was impossible to get to an agreement. And yet over quite a long time, we came up with creative solutions. Uh, and so as a diplomat, as a negotiator, one always has to believe if everyone is committed to the outcome, in this case, the outcome was to ensure Iran not obtain a nuclear weapon, uh, then people work to find solutions. I mean, in, in recently, uh, sort of re reading between the lines, it seems like Iran's president and foreign minister are not 100% on the same page. Uh, Iran's president has said that you know United States can return to JCPOA at any time, and we could meet with the United States in the context of uh, all members meeting together rather than a sort of a bilateral meeting. But Iran's foreign minister just two days ago said something very different, that, that the preference was for the United States to essentially uh, do compliance for compliance without joining the deal. In other words, remove the sanctions outside and we'll come into compliance. But if, that the, if the United States wants to come in, then, then there's a whole different negotiation about terms of its uh, re-entry. Now, I just I wanted to ask, ask you, uh, aside from the interesting thing that there, is, there seems to be a different message from, from the two, that, that whether this is even workable, uh, uh, you know, what does it mean, uh, sort of, uh, or, or, what, or, or why would the United States necessarily want to sort of return if the objective is to get Iran to, to comply with the deal? I just sort and, of want to, as, a, as an answer to what the foreign minister said. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Valley again, uh, uh, Minister Zarif is a very able negotiator. He is, um, knew every detail of the deal, as did his team uh, and his lieutenants, Abbas Arachi and Majid Ravanchi, now the ambassador to the UN. Um, so he is very smart about these things. Uh, and he is going to uh, try to put Iran in the strongest place he can if indeed uh, the Supreme Leader and the President say they want something to happen. Uh, so uh, none of this is surprising to me. And how the Biden uh, administration deals with it, um, I think uh, the President-elect's made clear what his framework is, how he would approach this. And I would expect that um, as the administration begins talking with our partners, um, we will see what the best way forward uh, should be. So uh, let me uh, uh, sort of uh, change, change a little bit of gear to, to look at the broader aperture of the region. So one of the issues that came up last time in the negotiation after it was concluded was the great pushback from United States allies in the region, Israel and Persian Gulf monarchies, including even massive lobbying in Washington with Congress and Senate and media, et cetera, against the deal. Now, you know, lessons learned, how can the United States, how, how would the United States think about a modality of, of, uh, of uh, engaging them without giving them veto over the, over the process or without, uh, uh, you know, getting Iran to sort of balk at the idea, uh, uh, because I, I, I would think that that's a challenge for the new administration about how to address the issue that last time sort of crept on it right at the end in a very serious way. So uh, 
The fact is that the Gulf Arab states and Israel were incredibly engaged uh, throughout the negotiating process. I met myself with the uh, uh, ambassadors from the Gulf Arab states and Jordan uh, and others uh, before and after every negotiating round. Uh, I met with Israel on a constant basis as well. Uh, and uh, when we began the negotiations, um, the Gulf said, just make sure you only focus on nuclear issues. Because if you're going to discuss regional issues, we need to be in the room. Then when it looked like we were about to have an agreement and we were approaching our presidential election, uh, I began to hear quite a different message, which was, how could you finish all of this and not deal with all the issues in our region? And I understand that. I understand it uh, politically. I understand it conceptually. Um, and I think that there's no doubt that uh, anything that moves forward uh, will have to have a very complex uh, consulting regime uh, that is part of the process. I, you know, when I teach my students about how important it is to understand what you're doing before you ever get in the room, uh, I explain that there were there was a very robust policy process inside the Obama administration, starting at the working level, getting to the deputies, to the principals, and then ultimately to the president. There was a uh, negotiating process with the Congress. We had literally hundreds of briefings, most of them secure with the House and the Senate, sometimes with all of the House and all of the Senate. Um, to get their views. What was said in the room wasn't always what was said outside the room. We understood that. Uh, we had uh, negotiations and got good ideas from think tanks and universities, you included, SICE included, and you personally. Uh, I negotiated with every member of the P5 plus one bi bilaterally and as a group. I negotiated with Arab states. I negotiated with Israel. I negotiated with countries like Japan, Korea, India, who had imported lots of Iranian oil and needed to get new oil contracts if they were going to reduce their levels. And we also negotiated with Iran. It's a very intense, complex process uh, to do it right. And even when you do it right, as you just pointed out, things change and people may not be satisfied. And we probably have learned some lessons about how to do it better the next time, uh, but uh, unfortunately there are no guarantees uh, because uh, time changes things, politics change things, leadership changes things, uh, and events on the ground change things. So I wanted to finally ask you, you know, um, looking back at two years of negotiations, sort of what are the most important lessons learned and whether there are things that it had to be done again, for instance, would you have would you have looked favorably on a termination clause, let's say, in in uh, or in, in in JCPOA, or if the if the sort of not necessarily that it it can be done in the future, but but looking back at that deal, uh, is there sort of reflecting on that that you think you would have you would have thought we should have done differently? I think we got a deal that met the parameters that. President Barack Obama set out and that Secretary Kerry, Secretary Moniz did such a spectacular job of achieving um, with the help of me and a tremendous team, core team and hundreds of people in the US government. Um, President Obama wanted to ensure that Iran would not obtain a nuclear weapon. For him, that meant closing down all the pathways to fissile material highly enriched uranium, weapons-grade plutonium, and a covert supply channel. We did all of that. Uh, there was a way, and uh, we know because the administration tried and wasn't able to achieve, uh, a way to terminate the deal through snapback at the UN, uh, quite an unusual mechanism, which was a creative mechanism. Uh, 
We had restrictions that stayed on for quite a considerable time, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. And the Iranians joining the additional protocol meant they would make a commitment uh, to there never being a nuclear weapon. So I think we did do what the president and our negotiating partners all want to do. This was not just a bilateral deal with the United States. Uh, there were other people engaged in this. Um, so uh, we achieved what the president set out, but had to do so in a context of other people meeting their needs. But we all had one main objective that we shared absolutely. And that was that Iran not obtain a nuclear weapon. So are there things that would have to be done differently now? Absolutely. Because 2021 is not 2015. Uh, we are in a different time in a different place, different politics, different players. Uh, things have happened. Events have taken place. More events will take place. And so, um, you know, I'm hopeful there will be a very creative team. Um, I hope a new team because you have to have fresh eyes uh, to what you do um, that will look at where we are, uh, do that consulting, do that tough policy process uh, and achieve success. Now, finally, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, since then there's been a lot more murmur of proliferation in the region, like for instance, Saudi Arabia's deal with China to, to um, also build certain, begin to build capacity. Uh, UA has invested in new people, although it's, uh, it's all under uh, tight control. But you know, to what extent this, this complicates uh, picture uh, in the sense that if, if the United States also has to think of additional non-proliferation issues uh, in the region? Well, we always have had to. Uh, and as you point out, the United Arab Emirates has the gold standard in one, two, three agreements in terms of how its civil nuclear program uh, is controlled. Um, and we've always been concerned uh, that Saudi Arabia uh, wanted to always have an option if in fact Iran got a nuclear weapon. Uh, and it is why it is critical uh, even with North Korea, which already has nuclear weapons, uh, to maintain the objective of denuclearization, uh, because we do not want to encourage proliferation. Uh, it, it is not a good thing for the world, let alone the United States, so, or the United States, let alone the world, whichever way you want to look at it. So um, yes, it is an ongoing concern, but it has always been a concern. Proliferation has always been uh, front of mind. So we're gonna leave time for question and answer. So I wanna hand off to uh, Nargis to start, start the Q&A. Sure, thanks so much. Um, so we have a few questions that have come in, Ambassador Sherman. Uh, the, one of the first ones was in the period between now and January 20th, is there anything that the European partners to the JCPOA can and should be doing to encourage renewed US participation in the JCPOA? Well, I think they've all made statements in that hope. Uh, they've all been in touch with, it appears, with uh, the president-elect, um, uh, though those are largely introductory courtesy kinds of conversations because we only have one president at a time, even if it's not your favorite um, or one's favorite. Um, I certainly think that the uh, Biden-Harris transition team, I'm sure, is looking at what's the best way forward and uh, doing work to try to present to the president-elect um, some initial steps uh, that he might take in this regard. Uh, I'm sure that work is going on. Um, so I think that's sort of what you do during this period and try to uh, make sure that there aren't things that occur, events on the ground uh, that make it harder for everybody. Another uh, attendee wants to know with the Trump administration's designation um, or uh, you know, potential designation of the Houthis as a terrorist organization, what impact, if any, do you think that this will have on Iran and the maximum pressure campaign and then further negotiations? 
I don't know exactly how much of an impact it will really have because uh, there's al already so much on the table. Um, uh, all of us want uh, the Yemen conflict to end uh, because the people of Yemen are suffering horribly, truly horribly, uh, both with cholera, with famine, with constant conflict. Um, Iran, in my view, did not start this conflict, uh, but then came in in support of the Houthis uh, in this conflict. Uh, and uh, the only people that are now getting served by this are the proxies, uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and others in the region, and the people who are suffering are the Yemenis. Uh, so in my view, I hope that uh, we do everything possible we can to um, try to ameliorate what is a humanitarian disaster, truly, uh, and, and uh, this miserable conflict. There's a question from a um, Mari, who is a SICE Europe student, um, and she says that she's currently an intern at the US mission to the UN in Vienna. And her question is, with the increased sanctions from the US and maximum pressure strategy, Iran has been seeking further partnerships with Russia, China, and Venezuela. How do you foresee the Iranian relationship with these states evolving under a Biden-Harris administration and strategy if their plan is different from the current maximum pressure strategy? I think we've all watched over the last years um, what I would call partnerships of uh, convenience or interest, but I don't think there's a, a whole lot of love lost among any of those countries uh, for each other. Uh, but I think that Iran has looked for places where it can uh, gain uh, friends. Uh, I use that term quite loosely because uh, I don't really think this is about friendship. I think this is about convenience and interests. Um, and so, yes, it is of concern. Um, uh, what exactly they will achieve out of this is not clear to me yet. Uh, there was no question that uh, Russia and China during the negotiations would talk with each other and talk with Iran, just like the Europeans would talk with each other, talk with us, and then talk as a group. Uh, so these kinds of uh, relationships are not new. Uh, and um, uh, we're operative uh, all through the negotiation. The Venezuelan peace, uh, of course, was not a factor really during the negotiations. Uh, but again, we have a terrible situation where the Venezuelan people are suffering mightily uh, because Maduro is not willing uh, to understand that he is only harming, not helping his own people. Uh, and uh, I think, again, the Trump administration has not had a strategy. They've had tactics, uh, but not a strategy uh, to work with others uh, in the region uh, to try to change those dynamics. Um, another question is that in 2018, uh, Europe reportedly offered to impose ballistic missile sanctions on Iran. If President Trump remained in the deal, will the E3 take actions on missiles if the US re-enters the JCPOA? I don't know the answer to that question. You know, the Europeans were very close. I understand I wasn't in it, so I don't know for sure. But I understand we're very close to an agreement uh, that would have kept the deal in place with some additional pillars, uh, as was the term at the time. And then uh, President Trump, it's my understanding, decided he didn't want those negotiations to go any further because uh, he really truly just wanted to blow up the JCPOA. Uh, and didn't want there to be a um, way out of doing that, which that agreement might have offered. Uh, I think that ultimately, um, there are lots of issues that we have to address, including uh, ballistic missiles all over the world, uh, because uh, particularly long range ballistic missiles are a threat to the United States if they can carry a nuclear weapon. So um, there's a lot of nonproliferation and arms control work that has to be done. It's very difficult work. Um, and uh, 
Uh, certainly there are countries in Europe that are ready to commit to that hard work. And I hope there are countries all over the world who are ready to commit to that hard work. So one question, one person is asking a question um, about how you envision this with the Biden administration, but I'm going to sort of make it a little bit more hypothetical since you're not speaking on behalf of any future Biden administration. So do you think that the next uh, U.S. administration, um, what will they need to do, if anything, about lifting the terrorist designation on the IRGC? And would how does that either impede or not any sort of future negotiations? So all of these designations, all of these sanctions will have to be looked at. Um, there may even be work going on now and there certainly are in think tanks looking at all of this and how you sequence it and what you do. And uh, you know, when we did the JCPOA, we worked out a very exquisite orchestration so that there would be implementation day uh, in 2016, a day when Iran would have done everything they needed to do and we would have done, and the partners would have done everything we all needed to do. Uh, so there are ways to sequence and orchestrate things so that they are um, acceptable to all the parties, uh, but that takes a being inside of the negotiation uh, to understand how best to do that. So I wouldn't begin today to say, do this first, do that first, or do them all together, or do them is this way, or do them with Europe in this way. Uh, I think it would be way premature to speculate how best to do this. Um, with um, another question is asking about the, the news within the past few days about a potential, or the Trump administration potentially thinking about some sort of strikes against Iran. Um, and so the question is about, depending on what happens between now and January 20th with the Trump administration having promised weekly sanctions against Iran, and then there are reports in the news about something beyond that, um, it's difficult to sort of see into the future when we don't know what any of those actions might be. But the question is asking how, um, how might that sort of figure into what the uh, the next administration sort of needs to think about when it comes to Iran or what the reactions of that might be uh, from the Iranian end? There's no doubt that if there are events between now and January 20th, it will have an impact, either a great one or very little, depending upon when those actions are. I'm very grateful that um, advisors around the president uh, if these reports are true, dissuaded him from taking military action, uh, warning him that it could easily turn into a much bigger conflict. Uh, and uh, he could not just do a discrete strike and take out a, a nuclear facility without a retaliation, which then might escalate uh, in ways that no one could imagine um, or might imagine and, and not want to have happen. So I hope uh, he stays on that path. Uh, it's not that the United States does not have the military cap capability to take out every facility. We do, even underground facilities. Uh, but uh, President Obama, I think quite rightly, decided that the risk of doing that was great to become a much larger war, perhaps an Arab-Persian war. Uh, and that secondly, Iran knows what it knows how to do. So it could rebuild those facilities and would likely do so in secret and underground uh, and might um, within three to five years uh, have a program all over again. Uh, and we'd have to do it again and do it again and do it again and take all of the risks of a larger war every time. Um, another person is asking that yesterday there was an event at the Atlantic Council um, and Federica Mogherini said at that event that Iran cannot take the first step. How much on the same page would you say the US and Europe are with regards to sequencing? Well, I don't know the answer to that because the Trump administration is not working with Europe to figure out how we should work together. Um, one of the strangest parts of the Trump administration, one of the most destructive, uh, was really uh, not engaging in the transatlantic partnership, which has been so critical not only to our security, our, our military security, 
uh, our national security, but our economic security as well. Uh, it, we are strongest when we are working with Europe, uh, not uh, in opposition or not without Europe. Uh, so I would hope those consultations would get underway. And as I said, one can always figure out a way to do appropriate orchestration if people are committed to an outcome. Um, and finally, uh, one attendee is asking, what kind of advice do you have for the Biden administration and future negotiating uh, teams about uh, and in respect to the JCPOA and negotiations with Iran? Um, well, I think, you know, I've said a lot of that today. It's hard work. Um, it, um, uh, the Biden-Harris administration has to be focused inside the United States in the first instance. Um, you know, none of us can forget that we are in the midst of a surging COVID pandemic. As much as anybody listening cares about the US-Iran relationship or lack thereof, the JCPOA or lack thereof, in the first instance, the United States has to become the power of our example. And that example has to be getting control of this raging virus. It has to be focusing in on our economy. It has to be uh, dealing with uh, our own injustice. Uh, otherwise, we are in a less powerful place to engage in national security and foreign policy. The two are inextricably linked. Now, that is not to say that the United States is not powerful today. We are very powerful. We have the most powerful military. We still have the strongest economy. Uh, we uh, have not done what we need to do in terms of racial justice. John Lewis always reminded us it's the arc of history and we have to keep going. And we've gone through and are in the midst of a very, very hard time where those disparities have shown up in the death of more people of color than of others during this coronavirus pandemic. And that's horrifying, as well as the death of so many African Americans uh, and Latinx members for that matter uh, in situations that just should not happen. So uh, Biden, Vice President Harris will have to focus first here uh, they can uh, send out, as I said, what I believe will be a very talented and experienced team uh, to begin the kinds of consultations and discussions and do the homework necessary to figure out how best to approach the JCPOA uh, and all of the other issues of concern where Iran is concerned. I know that Vadi also um, has some questions that he wanted yeah, to. So I, I, um, I mean, first of all, I wanted to say the points that you raised are, are, are very important, uh, these last points, because uh, anybody uh, working on a particular area thinks that that's the only issue that's in front of the administration. And even I think even in the foreign policy area, you know, there are, there are other pressing problems, including the climate deal, uh, China, et cetera. So uh, Absolutely. Right. Iran cannot be the beginning and end of, 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 uh, of US attention and North Korea as well. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to, I have two questions, but I wanted to first ask you, um, you know, the, the, the JCPOA along with the climate deal were important foreign policy uh, signatures of, uh, of, of uh, the Obama administration, achievements of the Obama administration which perhaps explains why uh, President Trump was so determined to, to uh, erase them uh, from, from the books. Do you think it's an opportunity or it makes sense or it's, it's feasible to think that, um, you know, return to both of these deals could be under the rubric of, of, uh, of, uh, of one act in a sense of uh, returning to to uh, commitments that the United States made at that point and restoring the legacy of, uh, of the Obama administration? Well, I'm, I'm sure that's part of it, but I don't, I don't think that's why President like Biden has spoken uh, to both uh, and to other issues as well. Uh, it's because he believes it's the right thing to do, that if we don't rejoin Paris, 
Uh, if we don't make sure that every agency and department understands that climate is change is upon us and that we only have limited time to get in front of it uh, and to deal with it, um, he's doing that because he knows we need uh, an earth uh, for our future generations. He's doing it because he believes that the infrastructure, the innovation in our country is going to be around renewables, is going to be around AI and quantum computing and um, uh, technology in ways that we can't even imagine yet uh, to bring good jobs, well-paying jobs to all parts of our country and to all citizens of our country. Uh, if he has, as he has said, wants uh, to get back to the JCPOA and also build on it to address other issues of concern, it's because he believes it's the right thing to do to ensure that Iran does not have a nuclear weapon. And the maximum pressure campaign of the past four years has not achieved what it set out to achieve, though, as I said earlier, I, I still not clear what it was, the objective was. Um, I think the uh, president-elect has also talked about reestablishing our partnerships uh, because he knows in competing with China that we will be stronger in doing so if we do it with Europe uh, and not alone uh, and with other countries around the world. Um, he knows that if uh, there are areas in which we have to challenge China, we will do it if we, we will do better if we do it with others. Uh, we know we've had a very challenged relationship with Russia and Russia has been a big factor in disinformation campaigns in the United States. Uh, and so we will have to think of a sophisticated approach in that regard that there are issues in areas in Africa, in Latin America, uh, in Asia, the Indo-Pacific uh, that have to be addressed. So you're quite right, Valley. Um, this is a big job <laughs> to be president of the United States and 2021 is not 2016. So yes, this is about doing some of the things that President Obama also believed were the right things to do. Uh, but I believe that President, and I believe, it's not a but, and I believe President-elect Biden wants to do them because they are the right things to do to ensure the economic prosperity and the security of every American. And I guess, I, are there other questions? Because I, uh, I don't, I know we have time maybe for one more, so I don't want to maybe sure. monopolize. There are, yeah, there are a couple and I'm going to um, ask one of them. And then if we have time, I'll ask the remaining one. Um, how one attendee is asking, how does the ambassador feel about, there's an upcoming forum in December that will bring together businesses from Iran and the European Union together to discuss a potential reboot of commerce with Iran. Uh, do such virtual gatherings bode well for a JCPOA version two? Well, you know, communication is a useful thing. One gains information and understanding. There have been some track two efforts that have gone on over the years. All of that has brought information and understanding. Uh, all of that is valuable when uh, you hope to get to a different place than where we are right now. Great. Um, and the last question, I'm not fully certain I understand the way that this person has asked it. So I'm going to try my best to, to sort of uh, summarize this. But um, they're asking, how is Iran's domestic political turmoil, such as the events of last November and the, and the uprisings and, and repression of it, the killing of Soleimani affected uh, Iran's stance vis-a-vis -vis the JCPOA? Um, and has maximum pressure campaign created a two-level negotiation with Iran? Um, or I guess they're probably asking sort of the, the, the difference between what the government might be saying and then what might be going on with the security and military apparatuses. Um, so sort of bringing those two together and what does that mean for the future of, and the impact it'll have on US-Iran relations? Well, all of these events have had an impact on where we are and where we might go. And um, during the JCPO, JCPOA negotiation, 
Uh, the IRGC and the Quds Force were certainly a factor uh, in the politics of Iran and therefore in the politics of the deal. Um, so I'm sure that will continue to be the case. Uh, you know, there's all, even been some discussion uh, in the Iranian press uh, about uh, IRGC leaders or former IRGC leaders running for president. Uh, so um, all of always in any negotiation, what happens outside the room matters as much, if not more, than what happens inside the room. As I said in uh, the book I wrote, which is partly about the Iran deal, about other things as well, national security, and personally, all of this is not for the faint of heart. It's hard work. Mm -hmm. It's courage and understanding of and use of power, and probably above all else, persistence. Thank you so much, Ambassador Sherman, um, for your time today. I'm going to pass it off to Professor Nass to close us out, but we really do appreciate you joining us today and for this, um, and this conversation. Thank you, Nargis, and thank you for all of your good work. I want to thank, uh, also thank Ambassador Sherman for joining us today and for, for discussing uh, this very topical issue, uh, an important issue before the new administration coming in. And uh, we hope that uh, uh, it, it won't become bigger than, than, than it is now and that uh, it, 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 the situation is diffused and then the nuclear deal uh, survives and, and could be built on going forward. But I want to thank you very much for, for a very rich conversation for, uh, for our students, for our community, and, and a lot of food for thought about how to interpret events coming along. Uh, thank you again, and best of luck with your own work. Thank you, and thank you all. And I wish everyone who celebrates Thanksgiving, because uh, you may have international students on as well, but everybody who celebrates Thanksgiving a safe and good Thanksgiving in very small groups of people. So be safe and well, everybody.